right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Our next speaker is Kevin Martingale. He practices up here in town. Uh, his firm is Bischoff Martingale. Uh, and he's going to be speaking to you about legal professionalism. So what does it mean to be a professional in the field of law? So please give him a warm welcome. All right. Well, thank you for braving what is likely to be rainy weather by the time you walk out of here. Uh, I appreciate it. You'll see that I've got on my good UVA tie. I will be standing in the rain tonight cheering for UVA against Boise State. Two days ago when we decided we would go, it was a 50% chance of light rain, which is now a 100% chance of an inch or more, according to my friends at the Weather Channel. So I convinced my wife that we really needed to do this because my kids wanted to go, and now I'm in the doghouse. Um, well, I am hoping. I am hoping. And we have, we have connections to UVA. We, the offensive guard, uh, Ross Burbank, used to babysit my kids. And the starting safety, Quinn Blanding, is the child of my law partner's secretary. So he's a great kid, and we see him a lot. And uh, we're hoping that these guys can pull it off tonight. Um, before I get started, I want to kind of learn a little more about the audience. How many of you have been practicing for less than a year? How many of you for less than five years? And how many of you for more than five? All right, so we've got a range. Well, let me say this. This is a timeless topic and something that all of us will have to deal with and at times will struggle with. Um, first, I want to tell you a little bit about my background. And, and I do this only to show that there's so many ways to end up not only practicing law, but also having a leadership position. Um, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and I started off going to public elementary school. My parents switched me into a private school at the middle school age. Went to collegiate, uh, which also happens to be where Russell Wilson went. Uh, you probably heard of him. He's slightly more famous. Um, so from there, I ended up at Hampton Sydney College, and. After one semester, because I was going to be a, you know, a runner there, but I'd been injured my senior year, so all the big schools that had recruited me lost interest. I went to Hampton City and decided that I was you know, too good to be at a Division III school, so I transferred to University of Florida. And at the time, I don't know if it's still true or not, but the athletic dorm was part of the football stadium. So I found myself uh, working on transferring credits that I had just earned and uh, trying to see how many AP credits they were going to give me comparatively to what Hampton Sydney gave me, trying to sign up for new classes, and it was turning into a mess. And this big head start that I had at Hampton Sydney looked like it was going to actually just be erased. I started feeling like I'd made an academic error, even though I thought that athletically and maybe socially I wanted to be at Florida. So I uh, called home and said, is there any chance you think they'd take me back? Because I literally hatched my whole plan in the athletic dorm in Gainesville, Florida. I decided I'd go back to Hampton, Sydney, if they'd have me as the prodigal son, and that I would graduate a year early, and I'd go to UVA if I could get in. And uh, they said yes, and so I rented a truck. I have no idea how an 18-year-old managed to pull that off. I don't recall, but I did. I drove myself, my apartment-sized refrigerator, a trunk of clothes, and a motorcycle back to Richmond. The next day, packed it all up, went to Hampton, Sydney, didn't miss a day of school. They all laughed at me. And I decided to buckle down, grow up, and see how well I could do. Went to UVA, uh, clerked for large firms like everybody else from UVA seems to do. Didn't really particularly like it. Struggled on the idea of whether or not, at that point, I even wanted to be a lawyer. So in between college and law school, I lifeguarded on the beach. And I decided that I would do that one more time instead of taking the bar. So the summer I graduated, I didn't take the bar. I was a lifeguard again. Rediscovered the joys of being really poor. Didn't particularly enjoy it as much as before I went to law school because I had gotten a taste of summer associate money, and I, and I thought that was a lot better. So um, then I decided I needed to take the February bar and once again had another grow-up moment. Uh, started practicing in a very small firm. Uh, I asked my then fiance, now wife of more than 20 years, I said, would you like for me to look primarily in Virginia Beach or Richmond? Because, you know, I was really from Richmond, had tons of ties there, but also really liked being at the beach. She thought about it for half a second before she blurted out Virginia Beach. And so I got a job with a very small firm, 
Uh, at the time, it was Epps and Brown. Some of you may know Richard Epps or Sam Brown. They were together back in the summer of 1992. After six months, they split. Went off with Sam Brown for a little while. Then I joined Sonny Stallings' firm. At the time, it was Stallings and Richardson. Practiced law with various iterations of that firm for 19 years. And then three years ago, Bill Bischoff and I split off to set up our own firm. Uh, for reasons that had nothing to do with money, it just had to do with kind of the direction we wanted to take the firm and what we wanted to do moving forward. And so that's the summary. Now, how did I end up in um, a position with the state bar? Well, th this is just one of those weird coincidence sort of things. I'd had some involvement with the Virginia Trial Lawyers Association, and I found it very rewarding, and I learned a lot being around very smart attorneys, and I liked going to the VTLA convention, and I frankly became more of a law geek than I ever was in law school. Um, so I saw that there was going to be an election for an open position. So I kept this little piece of paper by my phone until right up against the deadline, and I called the state bar, and I said, has anybody decided to run for this open position uh, for our part of Virginia? And they said, uh, no, we're so glad you called, because we were going to call down there and see if someone would just you know, be willing to be on the council. I said, good. What do I have to do? They said, fill out this form. You need something like, I don't know, 15 signatures or whatever it was. So I ran around my building. Kaufman and Canoles was downstairs from where I was working at the time. Got them to sign off on this and some other people too. Sent it in. And by coincidence, a deputy commonwealth attorney in Virginia Beach had done the same thing and talked to somebody else. So suddenly we're in a contested election. So I ended up winning that, got on the bar council, came up for after three years. That's how long a term is you can run one more time. I did. That time I didn't have an opponent and got increasingly involved in how it all works. Learned more and more about the state bar, the important role that it plays, and then found myself on the executive committee right around the same time that we ran headlong into a battle with both the governor and the General Assembly. The General Assembly fight was about judicial vacancies. And as a budget saving measure, the General Assembly decided in 2011 just not to fill vacant positions due to judges retiring, dying, whatever. And it created a nightmare in many courts. For example, the Eastern Shores judge, his one circuit court judge, hit the mandatory retirement age, and that meant there was no Eastern Shore resident judge. They're technically part of the second judicial circuit. But they have someone designated the resident judge. And if you look up in the Code of Virginia the term resident judge, only the Eastern Shore judge in Virginia has certain powers of appointment that no other judge has. And then there was none. So that was a problem. And we were, rotate we were already down one in Virginia Beach. We were rotating another judge over. Big mess. I then got very involved in that battle alongside the current president or the then president of the state bar. His name is Irv Blank. We also then ran into a, a budget fight with the governor. And as another budget saving measure, they proposed to take about $5 million out of our reserve fund and just move it into the general fund and use it for other purposes. None of that money being tax money. All of it being our money through dues and other programs the State Bar puts on because we're entirely self-funded. We, we govern ourselves, we fund ourselves, but we're not allowed to have the money totally separate. It's designated as ours, but it's still subject to being moved around by the General Assembly or the governor. So that was another fight. And suddenly, the position of State Bar became very obviously much more than ceremonial. You have to be ready and willing to defend our branch of government and our profession when the need arises. And then people then came to me, and they said, we would like for you to get in line to run for State Bar president. So I talked it over with my wife, and even though we have kids and it's, it does occupy a ton of time, we decided I would do it. And uh, I found myself in a contested election again. Um, a guy from Northern Virginia decided to run against me, so we had the first contested race in over 10 years. He was getting ready to retire and decided it would be a nice thing to be president, a nice way to cap off his career. Um, and being from a part of Virginia that has more lawyers than the rest of Virginia put together, you know, that was a concern. But uh, I, I won the election and then got on the ride of being state bar president, which was fascinating and very rewarding professionally. Now. Why do I tell you all this? I tell you this for these reasons. Number one, there are lots of ways to end up in the profession, lots of different ways to get interested in it. As you can see from my really weird route going through the University of Florida, and the only thing I really knew is that I was told I was pretty good at arguing, 
I knew I tested well on anything that had to do with English or verbal skills. I was like, well, that sounds like a lawyer. I guess I'll be one. That's really a strange reason to become a lawyer, but that's kind of how I got there. Once I got in it, and I started realizing how important it is and how much people depend on us, then I really started to care. And I was already competitive. I'd grown up a wrestler and a runner. I didn't like losing. And so those competitive instincts went straight into what I did as an attorney. My practice is I do a lot of litigation and appeals. I don't have very, I have nothing that you would call an office practice. Within the broad category of litigation and appeals, it's a very broad practice. But what it has in common with most of you, if not all of you, is that I have to be a problem solver. People come to me because they have a problem that exists now or they're trying to head off a problem that might be coming. Even if you're drafting a contract, what's the point? The point is to make sure you make the deal and that you prevent any unexpected consequences or problems. So we are problem identifiers and we're problem solvers. And that goes to the core of what we do. We as members of the state bar, in my opinion, have great reason to be proud, proud of our history. I mean, think about it. You are members of the Virginia State Bar, home to Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. Civil rights figures such as Oliver White, many others who helped this nation move forward. Virginia hasn't always been on the right side of history, but we've had some of the people who turned the tide and helped us get it right. We're the ones who came up with the Declaration of Independence, the United States Constitution, the idea of religious freedom. We have advanced a lot of things that matter to a lot of people in this country, and indeed the whole world. But what that means is that we have a tremendous legacy and responsibility to uphold. And that can be mighty difficult when you're dealing with certain people. There are people who are just flat out unreasonable. And so let me tell you what I've sort of figured out over the years. Aside from the fact that I'm a constant work in progress, people who dealt with the younger version of me would say, hey, what a hothead, you know, that guy. I was often wrong, but never in doubt. I have tried hard to learn that I am not always right and to listen more than just run my mouth, particularly when I'm dealing with very experienced folks and and judges, and you can, you can learn an awful lot by listening and watching. But let me tell you how I eventually boiled it down. I am convinced that one of the keys to success, whether you're talking about lawyers or you're talking about anyone, is knowing the difference between barges and pigs. Now, some of you are going, I have no idea what he's talking about. In fact, probably all of us. And so here's what I have. Do you know how to turn a barge? Slowly and with a lot of effort. And you must be patient. You cannot turn a barge immediately, no matter what kind of device you use, no matter how big the tugboat, you cannot turn a barge immediately. But you can turn it slowly and with a lot of effort. How do you teach a kid to sing? You can, and you shouldn't try because it wastes your time, and it annoys the pig. And so the key is this. You need to figure out what you're dealing with. Is it a barge or a pig? Fortunately, most problems and most people are barges. You cannot expect to change people immediately, whether it's your client, opposing counsel, a judge, your law partner, the civic league that you're in or that you're advising, Whatever. How many times have you instantly changed somebody's mind? You have a two-minute conversation, they speak for one minute, you get the other minute, and they go, you are right. You can't do it. Part of our role as problem solvers is trying to figure out what the key is, where the letter point is, what the person wants, what the other person is concerned about eventually getting that person to turn, and maybe figuring out in your own side what you can give up, as long as you get the problem solved. It's not an article of religion, what we do. Okay, you want to have an absolutist position? 
Save it for your faith. But you cannot be that way as a lawyer representing somebody else's interests. You have to be flexible, creative, energetic, curious, open-minded, a little stubborn, but not stupidly stubborn. You have to have a lot of things going on. You have to be competitive without being obsessive and angry, without being emotional about it. And it's complicated and it's difficult. But it's what professionalism requires. It's also what ethics requires. One of the ways I've identified the difference between a barber's and a pig is this. When I find myself having the same conversation over and over again, trying to reestablish the same early points I thought we'd gotten straight either five minutes ago or five days ago, and I'm having to backtrack constantly or pull somebody back on the topic because they keep going off topic, and we're trying to talk about this thing that needs to be dealt with, at some point you realize, I am playing this whack-a-mole game. Every time we make a point, this other thing that's unrelated pops up, and i got to deal with that, and this other thing pops up. We can't, you know, we can't get anywhere. We're on backtrack and reestablishing. I thought we agreed to one, two, three. We were talking about four. Yeah, but now that I've heard five, I think number one that fell off. At some point, you go, this didn't work. Now, with clients, what that means is, without hurting their interests or their position, you have to get out. You have to get out once you're that far off the page with your client. Once the client, once you start to sense the client's actually the enemy, the client's the problem, you must find a way to withdraw. And actually, the ethics require that. I have very rarely had to do that, particularly in active litigation where there was going to be a problem. A couple of times, had to have uh, a discussion with the judge about it. And without giving up any client confidence, it's just was able to make it clear this is not working. Judge, let me out. But you ethically, if you cannot advance the interests of your client, you can't even agree on what the objective is anymore. You have to get out. Dealing with opposing counsel, that one gets real tricky. A couple points in advice. One of them is that sometimes maybe it's just you and that lawyer. And maybe your client's better served by a different lawyer coming in. There is a handful or less of attorneys I just don't get along with. Just can't. I don't know what it is. And I deal with so many lawyers, I guess that's a pretty good percentage. It's just a small, small number. We just really don't get along. Generally what it means is I just don't over-communicate. I just deal with the person as required, try to make sure I do everything on time. If the person contacts me and needs an extension, even though I don't particularly like the lawyer, I will go ahead and try to be an agreeable professional person. But I try not to have too many encounters because I know it's not going to Maybe you just have to completely stay focused on what the objective is, keep all of your emotion out, whatever. Once again, it's your job to identify what the problems are and to try to figure out a solution for that difficult lawyer. There are difficult judges. How do you deal with these difficult judges? Well, a starting point is do everything really, really well. Give the judge less of a target to shoot at. When my dad was in med school. He was going through a surgery rotation with a notoriously difficult doctor. And my father had some experience. He'd been in the Army. He also had polio as a kid. He had a lot of real world experience. He'd grown up poor. He was the first person in his family to go to college. His parents were actually mad at him because he had the audacity to want to go to college instead of taking over the dry cleaning business in Florida. He was arrogant because he wanted to go to college. And then he went to med school that made him super arrogant. So this is the kind of real world guy you're dealing with. And he's sitting there in the surgery rotation. And he heard all about this doctor. And the doctor pulled the stitch and goes, cut. My dad leaned over and said, do you want that too short or too long? The doctor actually started laughing. Because the message was, I know I'm going to screw this up. So how do you want to screw it up? And they actually got along at it. I don't suggest you do that with judges. But I'm telling you, you will have that judge. And if you can find some way to make a connection with that person so that you can avoid screwing it up no matter whether you under-argue or you over-argue. Is the brief too short and inadequate or is it too, too long and repetitive and boring? You know, whatever. Try to figure out everything you can about the judge and try to 
avoid all the things you have learned are the nerve centers of the judge and make everything really good. Do everything early, obey all the rules, make sure that you don't act emotional or to give the judge a reason to feel like he's refereeing kindergarten. Do everything really well. That's the best advice I give. And let me tell you what else. There'll be some judges who are going to yell at you no matter what. They're just in tankers and drunk. That's the way it is. But in doing our job, we have to figure out what the judge wants, what the judge likes and doesn't like, as a part of doing our job. Is that for me? But I was plenty loud. But I'll take it. So... If I can figure out my technology. All right, there we go. So we talked about dealing with these difficult clients, dealing with the difficult opposing attorneys, dealing with the judges. Let's talk about another one. Dealing with your law partners or your bosses. That can be really tricky too. Very complicated. I don't tend to be someone who minces words and beats around the bush. It's interesting, my wife and I have been married for over 20 years, we're both super type A, and we never argue, because neither one of us has a hard time figuring out what the other one's saying. And we just sort of cut to it, you know, talk it out, and then it's over with, bang, done. Somehow that works. I find it actually harder in the law firm setting, because first of all, you're surrounded with what? A bunch of other know-it-alls, right? You know, everybody, a lawyer, often wrong, never in doubt. And so you're in that situation where you're trying to figure out how to deal with difficult topics, staff management, money, the way the money's cut up, where's this firm going practice-wise, what are we investing in in terms of staff, CLEs, what expenses do we want to pay for, not pay for, on and on it goes, and everybody thinks they have the magic answer. You have to figure out a few things. One of them is what do you want to be in charge of? I don't like dealing with, dealing with a lot of office management stuff. My partner likes it, I'm like, good, do it. We have no strict formula at the end of the year for how we divide things up. I'm like, I trust you. You're a fair guy. Figure it out. I don't care. Just tell me how you did it at the end. Works just fine. We don't have any money problems. That's why he's my law partner. But you have to figure out what works for you, and then you have to be pretty clear about it. And don't put off difficult discussions and decisions. I'm not saying barge in when somebody's super busy at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and they're a little freaked out and then say, I need 15 minutes of your time and be pushy. But... Don't keep kicking the can down the road either when you've got issues that need to be dealt with because it makes you less effective as an attorney. It's a festering problem. Ultimately, it does a disservice to you, to the organization, and to your clients. Because in the end, it comes back to making sure you're doing a good job for the clients. And if you've got an unhappy situation at your work base, it makes you less effective. It's part of being ethical and professional to make sure that you're able to give your best effort. And so when you're talking with your partners, or partner, or bosses in the city attorney's office, or the commonwealth attorney's office, or wherever you're working, or if it's a sole practice, and you've got staff to deal with, keep an open discussion, be straight about it, and make sure that you're communicating. Identify problems, because we're all problem solvers, and then try to solve them. These are the kinds of things that you must do. You must be sensitive to these things. I want to talk very quickly back to the state bar. What is the state bar? We are not organized like every other state. I think it's around, I forget the statistic, I think it's around 50% of the states have what's called a mandatory bar. So as you know in Virginia, if you have a bar card, you're a member of the Virginia State Bar. We have 30 some thousand fully active members, and then another 15 or 20,000 associate members, which would include judges, uh, people in other states who don't want to be active, but they don't want to lose their license either. There are a number of different ways to be an associate member. But it's a big organization, and it's mandatory in Virginia that if you're an admitted attorney, you're a member of the organization. It makes us part of the government, which has opportunities and it has pitfalls. One of the things we have to be careful about is we do not engage in what I call left or right politics. We don't take political positions. There's a 1990 opinion from the California, well, it's, it was California, Keller versus State Bar of California, and it went to the U.S. Supreme Court. And basically the upshot is, is that if you are mandating that professionals pay you money and, and that they're in the organization, 
simply because they're in the profession, like we are, then you can't engage in left-right politics. We can still advocate for our branch of government and try to advance our profession, but we don't pick controversial issues and then come down on one side or the other. Voluntary bar associations can do that all day long, and if you don't like it, you don't have to be a member. But we have a different rule book. We also have different pressures, and a lot of people don't really know how we're organized. First of all, we are legally an agency of the Supreme Court of Virginia. Our bosses are the Supreme Court justices. That's who we answer to. Now, as bar president, I'll tell you, it was a very tricky game that I had to play. I had a lot of different people that I needed to listen to. On the one hand, the state bar has to answer to the Supreme Court. And so you can't ever get in front of the Supreme Court running around representing things as being the position of the state bar because that then can be viewed as the position of the Supreme Court and can create a lot of controversy if you're not on the same page. But on the other hand, they don't want to micromanage what we're doing and they don't want to hear from us every day. So we had to understand their broad goals and objectives and then they expect us to go figure out how to talk about it and advance it without bugging them all the time. So that was um, a very interesting dynamic in relationship. The court was open to conversation, it just didn't want to be involved all the time. Then you have your large constituency of attorneys. Everybody who's admitted you know, has the opportunity to give us feedback and ask us questions and register complaints and whatever. And you know, I would hear from people from time to time. And quite often it was something that I didn't really deal with as president, so I would try to figure out how to point them in the right direction, but we got that worked out. Then there's a governing group of attorneys in the state bar, and the statistics are, it's called the Bar Council. That was the first thing that I ran for, and there are 81 members, 65 elected members from the judicial circuits, um, three officers, four conference chairs, nine at-large members appointed by the Supreme Court of Virginia. And they make the policy decisions of the state bar, and they also... Uh, make proposed rule changes that then go to the Supreme Court for approval. So within that, you have a smaller subset that is the executive committee, and then you get the president-elect, the president, immediate past president. And that's the favorite title, which is the one I have now. It means that you know they think I know something, but I don't have nearly as much responsibility anymore. So that's sort of the governing structure of it. And then within it, there are all these different committees and so forth, which I would urge all of you to get involved with, because I think it's an important part of our objectives as an organization that all of you get involved. It improves your profession, professionalism, improves your knowledge, it makes you better lawyers to be involved. Look at vsb.org, you'll see all kinds of different ways to get involved. Now what does the State Bar do? We have three core missions. Number one, number one, and it's in this order on purpose, public protection. We are self-regulated, we are self-governing. We're different from other professions. One of the things I do in my practice is I represent regulated professionals in front of their various boards. It could be the Department of Health Professions, DPOR, whatever. I represent doctors, um, vets, contractors, ABC licensed establishments. I do a lot of stuff in the Administrative Process Act. I will tell you, it's not as good as our system. It's just not. The decision making is not as good. The structure is not as good. I don't particularly like it but it's what I'm stuck with when I'm representing these folks. Our system is a lot better. And part of it is because the decision makers are lawyers. And it's what we know how to do. We know how to take rules and apply facts to them and come out with a logical outcome. That's what we're trained to do. So I think we're inherently better trained to do it than these other folks. A contractor acting like a judge is really not really very fair to anybody involved in that. But that's how those boards are set up. They're supposed to be a, a sort of like a self-governance model, but they don't have the same training and background to be acting like judges. We, we also have at the end stage, if you're going to have a possibly serious discipline, you, can either, you get a choice. There's a fork in the road if you're a lawyer. You can either go to the disciplinary board and have your trial, or you can choose a three-judge panel, three circuit court judges. And from there, you have an appeal to the Supreme Court. Structurally, it makes a lot of sense. We do a good job with it, but we depend on lawyers to volunteer to serve in it. I did it for six years on the local level uh, with the Second District Disciplinary Committee, and we heard, you know, we were sort of the first line of processing complaints to decide whether the complaint should go on or, or be terminated. Uh, we would hear hearings on relatively minor things. Um, 
The more serious stuff where you can have your license suspended and so forth goes to the board or to the three-judge panel, but it's the first level of this process. If you ever have an opportunity to get involved, please do. Once again, it's a part of advancing the professionalism, protecting our self-governance. General Assembly could swoop in at any time, pass a law, and change that. We don't want that. We want to stay self-governing. I think we do it so much better than other professions. The next goal, access to justice. We try to make sure that people have access to justice. That means more than just making sure there's a public defender or a court-appointed lawyer for a criminal case. It means trying to find ways to get lawyers to do pro bono work for those who need it and to make the court system more user-friendly for those who are trying to do it pro se. There's no requirement that people have lawyers. I think it helps a lot, but if they want to go in and try to do it on their own, then we try to make it understandable enough, simple enough, so that an ordinary citizen can go represent his or her own rights. So that's a very important thing we do. We try to improve access to justice. We have an Access to Justice Commission. We have pro bono committees. We have all kinds of different structures in place to try to improve this. Some states, you should be aware, have gone to different models. And it's a really interesting thing going on out there in the country right now. The state of Washington, for example, has got something called the Limited Licensed Legal Professional. And they've come up with something kind of like the physician's assistant, where you're not a lawyer, but you're more than a citizen. You have a limited license that lets you do certain things on a limited basis, not try cases, but you can do contract preparation or kind of like paralegal work, but it counts as a form of legal work. I don't like it, and I don't think we'll ever have it in Virginia. Part of the reason they have to have it is Washington's a huge state, and they literally had hundreds of miles with no lawyers. They either have one or two law schools in the entire giant state. And so they had big areas where they just needed more help out there. So that was their solution. I don't like it for a lot of reasons. Other states that have the same problem of hundreds of miles, some of the big block states out there in the West, have gone to um, uh, kind of an incubator system where you know how they put doctors out in rural areas and if you agree to live somewhere for three years, you get a certain amount of salary, and you see all the patients that come in, and they hope that some of them will stick around because they throw down roots. All right, there's a lawyer version where they'll have a lawyer in a remote area with a few lawyers who are associates who come in, get paid, I don't know, say $36,000 a year, plus a percentage of whatever you bring in. They hope that the lawyer will stick around at the end, but if you don't, that's fine. At least you gave some service to that area. Uh, but they have that kind of program, which I actually think is probably a good solution because at least you have fully trained, qualified lawyers who are supervised and learning and serving the public. But be aware that this access to justice discussion is going on in Virginia and, frankly, everywhere. Because of the way we're organized in Virginia and our population trends and we have a lot of law schools, I don't think we have that problem at all. But it is perceived as an issue nationwide, and one of the things you have to be aware of is changes in other places can lead eventually to changes here. If that thing about limited licensed legal professionals catches on in Washington, and if they think it's a success, there will come a time when there's a push for that here. And for a variety of reasons, including malpractice reasons, I don't think we should do it. The first area of practice they were allowed to get into, domestic relations. Now, I spent my first five years doing a lot of that until I decided I hated it too much. But I spent my first five years doing that difficult area of law, and it is complicated. Any of you who do it know how complicated it is, particularly with the military aspect of it, and people moving around, and then you've got to have certain things in order, so the order doesn't count in the eyes of the government, blah, blah, blah. It's complicated, and there are a lot of ways to make a mistake, and so then we're throwing these people out in the state of Washington in that, that area, and, and I don't think we should, um, but that's what they've done. Part of your job as members of the state bar is to rise up sometimes away from the papers on your desk and your computer in front of you and just look and see what's going on everywhere else because nothing happens in isolation. We're all under the United States Constitution. We've all got a federal code. And even though we operate as states, there are also linkages that pull us together. And trends elsewhere can end up here, so you just have to be aware of that. Which takes me to the third thing. So the first two are public protection, second, access to justice, and item number three is improving the profession. And we do that through continuing legal education, um, any number of different ways. That's kind of a broad topic. But we always try to improve the profession. And it can always be improved. 
we're in a conflict management business or the prevention of conflict business. Depends on what your practice is. But the bottom line is, is that conflict stinks. People don't like it. Okay, it's one thing when I was on a wrestling mat or on a track or a cross-country course. I mean, that's competition because it's fun. Most people don't come to you for litigation or an appeal because they're having fun. They're not having fun, and they want you to get them to the goal line. My, my, my law partner and I came up with our firm motto when we started the firm. It says on our letterhead and on our wall, a reputation for results. And there's sort of a joke in there. The joke is this. We didn't say what kind of results. But you know what? Clients aren't always obsessed with a particular result. You know what they want? They want it to end. They want you to get over the finish line. Whether you stagger across the finish line or whether you break the tape in first place, you know what? They're not looking to marry you. And if they are, you've got a different problem. <laughs> they want it to end. And so part of our job is to get them to a finish. And to figure out, and goals can change along the way, keep on checking back in, what is our objective? Where are we going with this? What is our point? Let's make sure that we are always deriving a benefit from the cost. There's always a cost, even if you're on a contingency. Court costs, time costs, lost sleep, worry costs. There are always costs to whatever it is you're doing. Even if you're doing document preparation, there are costs. Everything costs something. And so you have to always make sure that you and your client are continuing on figuring out what are the things that you're trying to achieve and working towards those goals. Now, I want to talk, um, you know, it's interesting. I've gone back sometimes, and I've looked at what other people have said. Other bar leaders, when did they say these things? And, you know, it's interesting. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, Ten years ago, a lawyer who was a very well-respected lawyer in Richmond, you may know Frank O. Brown. Frank Brown's been around a long time. And... Very well regarded. And he did this column for the, um, for the State Bar's publication, and it was called Civility and Professionalism. We've written about this a lot of times. But Frank did it 10 years ago, and he had some bullet points that I really liked. And I, I singled out some of my favorite ones from what he said. And he got a lot of this from talking with judges and lawyers. So he doesn't claim to be an original author. He just sort of derived this from a lot of discussions, and he distilled it down to his big list, and then I picked out my favorites in there. So first of all, he makes the point, civility is a fundamental component of professionalism. And believe me when I tell you, you're going to have a hard time being civil sometimes. You just have to learn to take a deep breath and call time out. There's a guy in Norfolk who blows up at the drop of a hat all the time. And he and I used to hate each other. And then we got to know each other a little bit socially, and I started figuring him out. And it's just when he's wearing his lawyer hat, he just feels like he needs to sort of kind of you know, bow up and prove something. And I found that early in my career, I wanted to dog stare people like that and go, well, you want me to take you out? You know, you, if you're going to act like you want to fight, I know how to do that. Let's go. You know, and then I realized, wait a minute, I'm a lawyer. What am I doing? And I realized it was also, you know, I didn't feel good. It made me feel unprofessional. It made me feel kind of sick, you know, being involved in this kind of stuff. So I actually learned how to completely defuse him. And we had a case, and we were in the court uh, hallway in Norfolk um, in the last year, and the other two lawyers get into this argument with him, and I mean, it's getting out of control. And I managed to kind of you know, laugh a little bit. Wait a minute, what are we doing here? Hold on a second. I said, you know, there were several lawyers on my side, and we had one opponent. And I think that was part of the problem. He felt like he was outnumbered, and he was going to take us all on. I said, come here a minute. And we walked down the hall, and I talked him down. I said, we're not trying to attack you. Bring it down. What can we do to get over this? And it was fine. Problem was solved. If, every, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We're not those people. We can't be those people. Those people are ineffective. If the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but there's a lot of stuff that's not a nail out there. And lawyers rarely, rarely have good results 
by going full steam ahead, running over everything in sight. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Being more like a jujitsu guy does work. Figuring out how to use your opponent's momentum, how to do different things, but you cannot run just straight at people and expect something good to come out of that. It doesn't work. There are many examples, but trying to maintain your cool and to figure out, even if it means calling time out and going, you know what, I'm about to lose my cool. Can I have a break for a minute? And then extracting yourself out. That's being a professional too. It's also being civil. Keeping your cool. He says also, civility is really the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Sounds trite and small, but do ask yourself that question, particularly when you get a call on a Friday and somebody's looking for an extension to file something. They've, they've screwed up, they got tied up, caught up in a court or a long deposition or something happened or staff was out, sickness, illness, whatever. I don't even demand excuses out of people. If I can give someone an extension, I will do it. I will do it, even to people who don't really deserve it. Because, let's face it, most of the time they're going to get it anyway from a judge, most of the time. And if you develop the reputation as being the person who constantly says no and is a jerk, the judges remember it, the lawyers remember it, and guess what? You're now less effective as an attorney. So there's actually a reason that benefits your client to maintain a reputation as someone who plays fair, who does things fairly. Some people will tell you, well, you know, you've got to make sure you have client permission on every single thing you ever agreed to like that. Uh, that's not exactly true. You make it clear in your engagement letter to your, to your client at the start that all strategic decisions, including those about deadlines and extensions, are yours. That takes care of that because it's your reputation at the end and by the way, client, when my reputation is good and I'm known for being effective and being fair, that helps you too. So just think, that, think about ways to make sure that you retain control over all strategic decisions. The big goals, the big decisions, the spending of money, that belongs to the client. The strategic decisions, they're yours. Make sure that you make that clear to clients. This is a good piece of advice. The art of the graceful apology is an essential component of civility. Amen, amen. All of us will make mistakes. All of us will sometimes also be rude. Me too. I've done that. I one time got completely dressed down by a very well-respected Norfolk Circuit Court judge. And then a month later, I was profiled in this magazine article about, you know, the young gun, new lawyers, and all this stuff. And he was the first one to call me up and say, by the way, I want to tell you, you know, with the exception of that other little thing, you do a great job, blah, blah, blah. It was very complimentary. And it made me feel even more ashamed that he had jumped me about me getting into an extended argument in a deposition that went on for pages. They don't like that. And he didn't like it, and he told me so. And I never did that again. Learn to say you're sorry, whether it's to a judge, your client, your staff, whomever. You can't always go around defending your position. It's unproductive. It's unprofessional and it does a real disservice to your long-term success and reputation. Frank says, lack of civility on the part of attorneys and their clients makes the job of the judge harder in deciding cases on their merits. Negative behavior antagonizes the decision maker. Absolutely true. I've had some very vigorous cases. One comes to mind with Conrad Chumadine on the other side. It was a defamation case. He's a very well-known defamation lawyer. Uh, the case went on for days. Um, in fact, we've had a couple of cases, and we have never had an argument. We had disagreements, but they were calm. It was not a big deal. At one time, the judge kind of fussed at us about something where we were calmly saying something, but he didn't like what we were saying. It sounded like we were sort of kept on saying, well, for the record, well, judge, that's an invitation to commit error, and it sounded like we were trying the case for an appeal, which is annoying to a trial judge, and I understood it. And I apologize. I said, Judge, that's a good point. We should stop talking like that. That's annoying to you, and I know it. And comes, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, he, was, he, he didn't like the idea he'd upset the judge either. But we didn't have, this was not a personal thing with us. We, we battled long and hard, but not in an un, incivil, impolite way. And in the end, it enabled the judge to do the judge's job, the jury to do the jury's job, and, you know, it was fine. 
It was fair. Litigation is hard enough without antagonizing the judge and making it so unpleasant that it becomes incredibly difficult. Depositions should be conducted in the same civil matter, manner as if the judge were in the room. True. It also applies to meetings, phone calls, you name it. I frequently, particularly in divorce cases back in the day when I did that, I used to tell my clients, I want you to pretend the judge is there watching everything you do. you got a little judge sitting on your shoulder. And if you remember that, then you will get to the right answer and the tone of the right answer. Please do that. Same thing goes for you as a competitor, as a lawyer. If you just remember, if the judge were here, would the judge like the way I'm acting? Or if you don't like that, how about your spouse, your significant other, your child, or your parent? You've got somebody you care about, and I want you to picture that person sitting there watching and ask, am I doing a good job right now? Do I have the right attitude and the right tone? Is it, am I substantively prepared, and am I making good points, but I'm also doing it the right way? Tardiness, rudeness, and a lack of preparation are forms of incivility. Amen. You see this? I've been practicing law for over 20 years. I've tried tons of cases. And this is my 2015 edition of Virginia Rules Annotated with all kinds of little you know, tabs all over it and stuff because I look at the rules over and over again to try not to screw it up. That's called preparation and trying to be on top of it. And folks, we've got a really difficult job, difficult profession. You can't be over-prepared. Be prepared. Be on time. These things are critical to lawyers. We live and die by deadlines and words, misplaced commas. There's so many ways to blow it, which means you've got to be really mentally alert, awake, curious on top of it. You've got to be on top of it. I'm so old-fashioned, I still use the at-a-glance calendar. You know what? I've got every single one of them in a drawer that I've ever had. Same calendar from 1992 to now. Got all of them. I don't have files that old, but I got my calendar. Someone says, I met you on such and such a day. I go, really? Well, let's see about that, because it's on my calendar. But this calendar, and I use a yellow pad, so old-fashioned, all I carry around is calendar and yellow pad. These are my phone calls. This is a to-do list down the margin. I mark off things as I get them done, and when I get to the bottom, I write a date on it, I tear off the sheet, fold it up, and stick it in a drawer. And about every year or so, I clean out the drawer. But that's in case there's a phone number I need, or something or other, you know, I can go back and try to find that, that yellow sheet of paper, and I know what week it was or what period of days it was. Find what works for you is just the message. There's no one way to do it, but care enough to develop a system because being unorganized, unprepared, or late, that's a form of rudeness. It's a lack of professionalism. Don't let it happen. Disrespectful, deliberately provocative behavior and invectives should never be a part of a professional's conduct, obviously. The negative behavior of individual attorneys may provide the basis for members of the public generalizing about the legal profession as a whole. One of the things I've tried to figure out over the years is how not to needlessly antagonize an opposing party. So that when I'm taking a deposition, first of all, I'm a believe, I changed my whole approach to depositions at some point. I started realizing you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. Deposition should be a conversation. You want the person to tell you things. So why are you yelling at the person in the deposition? That's stupid. Know what you want to get. Get in, get it, get out. Don't waste time with a whole lot of nonsense and wind up and all that. Get in, be efficient, get the information nicely, and get out. Don't waste everybody's time. That's being professional. It's also effective. When you get into the courtroom, if you have to be a little bit pushy to you know, get the person to agree to what you said previously in a deposition, I understand you can get a little cross in your cross-examination. Don't get needlessly so. But the fact is, I, you know, I've had people that I thought I kind of went after in court who sometime later hired me came to me and wanted me to represent them on some new problem. I've had jurors hire me too. I consider it the ultimate compliment because they thought it was effective. Try to get 
people on the same page with you, even if it's the opponent. That is really, that's really the art of being persuasive. Is when you're not only persuading, you, you know, your clients are obviously agreeing with you. Who else in the room can you persuade? Consider that the ultimate challenge. The opponent shouldn't hate you. The opponent should respect you and maybe even wish you were the lawyer for the opponent. That is the key. Professionalism and civility benefit everyone, lawyers, judges, and the public. Another amen. Obviously lawyers and judges, and obviously the clients, but the public at large. We want our public to have confidence in our government. We can't control all three branches, but we can have a whole lot to do with the perception of our branch of government. And a lot of members of the public do not respect our branch of government. They're suspicious of it. They think it's sneaky. They think lawyers are slimy. They think the U.S. Supreme Court is very political. They got all these bad ideas. And we can do our part, not just in our own practice, but we can speak to groups. We can talk at high schools, middle schools, elementary schools. We can get involved in every opportunity to get on a stage and talk to people and talk the gospel about what we do and why it matters. We can take problems and conflicts in a free society, help sort it out in a civil way without it being civil war, and get to solutions. It's really important. So there's an opportunity for you there. There's a 1962 opinion from the U.S. Supreme Court, and it's called N. Ray McConnell. And it's got a quote that I love. And the quote is this. An independent judiciary and a vigorous independent bar are both indispensable parts of our system of justice. Now, the case was about a lawyer who was found in contempt for supposedly pushing back too hard in the courtroom, and a judge got mad and held him in contempt. And somehow that ended up in the U.S. Supreme Court. I don't know how. But it got to all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the court ruled in favor of the lawyer. And notice what the court said. An independent judiciary, not a political judiciary, an independent judiciary, and a vigorous independent bar, vigorous and independent. Those together are both indispensable parts of our system of justice. We have to remember that at all times. We need to cherish and protect our professional independence. You are not your client's guard dog. People call me and they go, I, I want to get you represent me. I heard you're a pit bull. And I always correct them. No, I'm not. I'm an attorney. I'm a problem solver. I'm not anybody's attack dog. And you don't want that either. If I indiscriminately run around attacking and biting, I'm not getting you the best results. And I don't, by the way, do whatever you tell me to do. I'm an independent attorney. We are self-regulating. We're independent. And we need to be vigorous. Vigorous on our deadlines. Vigorous on our communication. Vigorous in our efforts on behalf of our clients and vigorous in controlling ourselves too. I can't tell you how many times I have really wanted to just reach over and slap somebody. And I never have. I've never come close. I've actually had some lawyers kind of freak out. And one of them even did it in the courthouse one time. And he's yelling and acting just nutty. And I, I literally just I said, OK. And I grabbed my briefcase, and I walked on down the hall and went into the courtroom. And after a few minutes of composing himself, he came down the hall and he went in and, and we had a hearing and instead of me responding at all. Vigorously controlling yourself is also an important component of what we do. So I want to conclude by saying this. And this is actually a Jefferson, a Jefferson quote. And it goes like this. The boisterous sea of liberty is never without a wave. We have such an interesting profession. It's aggravating, it's tiring, and sometimes you're going to hate it. But think about our opportunities, the essence of what our country is. We are a part of it. We're part of that boisterous sea of liberty. But remember, it is boisterous, and it is never without a wave. So prepare yourself accordingly. Thank you.
Thank you very my, much. My, my dog eared rule book. <laughs> okay, we're going to take a 15 minute break. There's coffee and tea outside, so feel free to help yourself. And we'll be starting back with our next presenter at 11.15. Okay, we're going to take a 15 15-